Welcome to the Thrive Today podcast. I'm the media host, Natalie Bourne. I'm not only the media host for Thrive, but I'm the founder of Innovation Meets Leadership. And our primary focus at Thrive Today is to help you identify the authority of God's word and connect it to the relevance of your success at work. Well, today we're speaking with Katie Cole. Katie has spent the last 25 years serving the local church ministry as the executive director of one of America's largest and fastest growing multi-site churches, a director of leadership of um, leadership network, and she's also the founding member of Women's Executive Pastor Network. Katie's authored books like uh, Sticky Note Leadership, Developing Female Leaders, and her latest book, Finding Your Leadership Voice in 90 Days, which if you are part of our Thrive Today community, this was in your box this month, which is so, so awesome. And you got to garner her wisdom. She also wrote in our Thrive Today magazine, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Welcome to the podcast, Katie. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'm really honored to be here. Well, okay. So we've got to start with this question as I was looking into your background a little bit. I was so curious. I was thinking, how did she go from a registered nurse to speaker, author, conference speaker? Like, I'd have to hear a little bit more about your journey. Oh, yes. Well, uh, I went to nursing school because I really wanted to serve God and help people. And I thought being a foreign missionary would be the perfect way to do that. Uh, and a lot of that kind of comes out in the work that I do now with women, especially women from a faith background, because I just didn't have a lot of role models or or even know that there were options for women. I kind of thought you either married a pastor. And when I went to my Christian college and broke off my engagement to a future pastor, I thought, well, that's not the path I'm taking. I guess now I'll be a missionary on the foreign mission field and wear skirts every day and, you know, deliver babies on a dirt floor. And uh, so that's kind of the path I went down, not really consciously thinking that, but I just didn't think there were other options, I guess. And um, but as God would have it, you know, even when we think we're know what we're doing, really, he's going to direct our paths to where he wants us to go. And so I ended up on scholarship for nursing school to move to South Florida. I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I moved to South Florida to fulfill that scholarship at a hospital. And then doors kind of opened for me there. So uh, I served at the hospital for two years. I was a mental health nurse in the inpatient psych unit, which as it turns out, is like really great training for both ministry and leadership and parenthood. So <laughs> it was a great, wonderful time. Uh, but then I got recruited to a Christian uh, college here in town. So I started a health center there, started a counseling center, eventually became dean of students, picked up a master's degree in human resource development. And again, I, I don't know that I'm someone who's got some big grand vision of what I'm going to, you know, what God has me to do for him. Every time I think I make a plan, it never really works out. So I just sort of walk through the doors God opens. So that was the door there. And we happened to be attending a church that was growing really rapidly at the time. And when I finished my grad degree and I was getting a little burned out at this high capacity job, I was pretty young. I was still in my 20s and I was probably in a little over my head, to be honest. Uh, they offered me a job to come help them sort of scale ministry. And I've been in church most of my life and I volunteered a lot. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'll like now I'll walk through this opportunity. And so I kind of went into ministry in my mind. I would sort of like do it for a couple of years till I got married and had a bunch of kids. That didn't really happen and life took a detour. So I ended up staying in ministry now for 25 years and uh, kind of grew in leadership with the church. When I came on staff, we were about 3,000 people, which was the biggest church I had ever seen or ever imagined seeing. And But by the time I left, I oversaw our nine campuses. We had over wow. 20,000 uh, in live worship on the weekends with a huge online campus, uh, started our school of leadership. And then I started my own business, uh, a leadership development company. I worked with multi-site churches, but I also had a whole arm that worked with fast scaling businesses, uh, particularly who were doing multi-site. And so that was kind of my specialty then for the last six or seven years. And then in the process, wrote this book about women and then that took off. And so now I talk about that a lot. So I just, I, I'm like, I never really get bored. I just sort of look for the open door and God always has something fun in there for me. That is like a fantastic career of just like different twists and turns of just like when I hear your story, I'm like, man, you were on a journey with God. And I feel like God has such a sense of humor with us. And he also doesn't tell us more than we can handle. So it's like, hey, this is this is what's next. This is what's right in front of you. And I I think if you were to when you were going to school for, to be a registered nurse, if he had shown you all that, I, I don't think you ever 
would oh, have no. moved. <laughs> yeah, well, for sure. And I think the one thing I do like to point out to women, though, is I I never had a plan. I still don't have a plan. Like, that was part of my surrendering to Christ is like, stop planning your own life. God's got a better plan. Just follow him. But I always knew uh, when a door was a next step for me personally. I always knew it was a step up in leadership. It was more pay. It was more responsibility. It was an area of interest that God had put on my heart. I was going to be able to help people I currently wasn't able to reach or connect with. I knew I had something to offer and I knew I was going to be better for the experience. And so even though I didn't stay in one industry or have any sort of like up into the right career, I always felt like I've been climbing up and that uh, I feel really proud of. And I really want to encourage women, even if you don't know what you're doing, just make sure every time you say yes, it's a yes forward. It's not a yes to the side or a yet or a step backwards. That's so that's so good. I, I feel like that's that's a fundamental principle that um, and I, I just want to pull forward this this time that I uh, was leaving a company and I was getting ready to go to another company. And I said, hey, uh, I called five ladies and five men because my boss said, will you please help me fill this position? I said, would you be interested in this role? And the men said, oh, put my hat in the ring. And the women said, oh, I'm not ready. Give me a couple more years. I'm not ready. And I'm thinking, I'm calling you because you're ready. Like you're you're there. You can totally do this role. And I just, I love that you said that because oftentimes we discount ourselves before we've gotten the no. Like we give ourselves the no before anyone else ever has. And so I love that mantra of thinking about how to step forward. We actually call that phenomena in the uh, research around women leaders, the sticky floor. So some of us have probably heard of the stain or the, the glass ceiling in the church world. We call it the stained glass ceiling. Uh, you know, those kind of barriers and systems and structures and titles and pay. But the more powerful one, uh, I think for us as women to know is what's called the sticky floor, which is the, those thoughts and conversations and dialogues we have with ourselves that keep our feet stuck to the floor that yeah. prevent us from putting our name in the hat, as you said, or prevent us from saying yes to a promotion or like my plate is so full. I don't want to overdo. I'm like, I've never heard a guy turn down a promotion and a raise because his plate was too full. Yeah. So we have kind of these like ways of thinking that keep us sort of stuck to the floor rather than just saying yes and like trusting that if God's got it for us, he's going to figure it out or we can say no to some things or we can ask for help or we negotiate an assistant in the proposal or you know there's a lot of ways to solve um, most of the things that are holding us back we just have to be willing to actually attack them instead of let them weigh us down I love that and I love I love what you're saying because when when you do that research and when you kind of look through that what they show is that a woman feels like she has to have 90 percent right to go after that job Whereas a man feels he has to have about 50%. So what we actually need to do is we need to lower the bar that we're putting on ourselves, And we need to to know that it's new, which means I'm going to have to learn. I'm going to have to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to have to I've never it. done this before. I won't be perfect from the first day. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. We can't go after perfection if we're going to move forward. I love, I love what you're saying there. So I want to talk a little bit about your article because... Some of what you're saying, I think, even leans into this. You have something in your article that you talk about called the fear meter. Would you talk about that a little bit? Sir, sure, this is my uh, phrase for uh, for myself that I've got this fear meter in me that really is not connected to reality whatsoever. There are seasons of my life, especially now at my age, I look back and I'm like, boy, those were actually really risky things I did. And uh, I made some really poor decisions that God just for whatever reason just helped me glide through there without getting the, you know, the the disaster that really could have happened to me. And I felt no fear. I was fully confident. Uh, and then there are other areas of my life where uh, the chance to speak in an event or to share my ideas or to come on a podcast like this. And my fear meter is off the chart. And yet I've been speaking about topics like this for 20 years. I am a, I am a communicator. I have a master's degree in training. Like there are, a, I have a lot of experience and a lot of reasons to have no fear about being in an environment like this. And yet my fear meter can like go off the charts. And so for me, it's, it's kind of that sticky floor mentality. It's that, boy, how I'm feeling is really not the indicator as to whether or not I should say yes or no to something. Because my, I always say my fear meter is broken. So I, you know, even when I feel the safest, I'm probably at more risk than I realize. And even when I feel really scared, I'm probably way more qualified than I'm feeling. And so it's that whole idea of kind of like, 
um, listening to our feelings. I always say like, I want to listen to my feelings. If I'm feeling fear about something or I'm unsure whether I can do a good job, I need to kind of take note that I'm feeling it, but I can't trust the volume. Mm. So sometimes my fear volume is so high, but it's just a little fear. It's like, what if I fail? Or what if I look stupid? Or what if I say something wrong? And then I just play the scenario out. Well, what if, what if I do say something wrong? Well, nothing's going to happen. I mean, I can always email and have you edit something out or I can just let it go out there, but probably no one's going to care. And even if they do the worst case scenario, someone says something and I apologize and we all move on with our life, right? Mm -hmm. But the volume is so loud that if I listen to the volume of my feelings, I, it can really lead me astray. So I want to listen to the fact that I have a feeling, but not listen to the volume and then really take it before the Lord and be like, what are you doing here, God? And what is chances are there's a faith step involved. And so what is it that you're calling me to? And how do I fill myself with the Holy Spirit in a way that fills me with God's strength, God's peace, God's confidence? I don't need to be confident in myself. The whole point of the gospel is we can't do it on our own. I need to be filled with God's strength. And I trust he will help me be able to do whatever it is he's asking me to. I love that. And so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about this this concept that you have, which is like the superwoman syndrome. Because I think, I think what happens is, like you're saying, when that fear goes off, sometimes we can try to overcompensate for that and think that therefore we have to kick into this almost this gear that doesn't exist for anyone. But in our mind, it's like, oh, I just need to 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 be superwoman. Yeah, I think this the spiritual concept is really this idea of striving in our own mm -hmm. strength or in the flesh that we see something ahead of us and we want to make sure it's awesome. And a lot of times that starts out with really good motives, especially high capacity female leaders that are listening to a podcast like this. Like you have a lot of responsibilities. You have big dreams. God has gifted you with a lot. You want to steward that well. You've been given opportunities. You're being you know, given doors that are opening that you want to walk through and you want to deliver. You want to meet expectations. You want to even blow their minds, right? I don't want to just like meet the expectation. I kind of want to like, you know, wow them a little bit. And all of those are really great attributes of leadership and are particularly present in female leaders. Yeah. The challenge is, is when we hold ourselves to those really extreme standards on every single part of our life, every single moment of every single day of our life. And humans just don't operate that way. Again, when we read the Bible, like, we aren't equipped to be able to do that. And so part of it is uh, realizing this idea of being a superwoman in all domains and being good at all the things in my life and 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 uh, sort of excelling and being above and beyond everywhere really is just a recipe for disaster and burnout. And so part of it is recalibrating that and and really taking a look at what is our leadership voice? Like, what is the leadership voice God has given us? You know, what, Natalie, what's your unique voice? What's my unique voice? What's everyone's unique voice? It's a combination of your giftedness. It's a combination of your experiences, your personality, the role you currently are given. You know, the voice I had 10 years ago is not the voice I have now. Right. And it's really pretty amazing to see how God will honor when you just work really hard at the things right in front of you and do a good job. Not a perfect job, but a really good job that you can be proud of. And then what are the callings that he's called me to? You know, I can be called to be a wife. I can be called to be a mom. I can be called to be an employee, a business owner, a leader, a neighbor, a friend, a sister, a daughter. We have a lot of callings. And I think if we're not careful, we can sometimes win in one calling and not win in the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I kind of always am just like, I just want to do like a passing grade in everything, <laughs> right? Like I don't need A pluses and everything. I'm 50 years old. I'm way beyond that. Uh, but I'm like, I, I really actually want to have a passing grade in everything. I don't want to have my business do awesome, but my kid is feeling like I've forgotten about him. That to me, that's a fail. Now, I also don't want to be such a, a focused on my kid that my life is centered around my child, right. that I don't actually fulfill the role that God has for me in my local church. Right. We're all if we're a Christian, you're called to be a part of a local body and both contribute and receive. Sometimes I'm really good at contributing and I'm terrible at receiving. Yeah, that's not actually the call to be in community. The call to community is both. And so we have to really kind of take a step back, let go of that superwoman complex and just be like, God, this is really just between you and me. What is it that you've actually called me to in this season of my life? And by the way, those seasons change and sometimes change dramatically and sometimes change quickly. Uh, what do you have for me in this season? What are the priorities? What are the resources you've given me? 
And how do I steward that to the most? And that includes my health and my sleep and my mental health and my friendships and, you know, all the relationships I want to steward. And what are you asking me to put pause on or to just have be a lower priority? Doesn't mean I don't love, doesn't mean I don't care. Just means you haven't called me to be all in in those areas right now. When we can really discern that, we can take the pressure off and simply show up, trust God's Holy Spirit to give us what we need in the moment and let him stretch who we are to be everything he's called us to be, but nothing more than that. That's so good. I mean, oh my gosh, just so many nuggets in what you just said. I'm like, we should slow that down and go back because that was so good. And I think I think that what you're leaning into is, and this is so important, as women, we need to ask. As the seasons change, we need to be asking. We need to be in a place of constant communication with God so that we're asking for what's for me in one season is not necessarily for me in the next. And I think that is something that, you know, we continue to just, some of us, you know, we continue to say yes to everything and then we're holding like- We just keep adding. Yes, Yes. it's so easy to add. Yeah, and so I think think that is such an important inflection point. It feels simple, but it's not. Because when you get into that superwoman complex, like you talked about, it's easy to just take it all on and not actually ask. One of the principles I talk about when I teach women leaders is this idea of the size of plate you have. So when we start off in our leadership, um, it's kind of like a little dessert plate. You know, you've got like a few talents and a little bit of experience and a couple opportunities. And then we start to say yes to things. So we fill up our plate. So then we move from like the dessert plate to the salad plate. Then pretty soon that's filled up. Then we move to the dinner plate. Pretty soon that's filled up. And we're like, I've got so much on my plate and new opportunities come. And we're like, you know, shoving the mashed potatoes on and the corn's rolling off the back. And we're like, so then we kind of like pull out the turkey platter, right? The the dish that's really only supposed to come out once a year, but we start Uh living off that every day. Wow. Well, the challenge with that is we start making decisions about what's how much room do we have on our plate? We're not making a decision about what is God actually calling me up to. And so I like to challenge women, if you if you feel like you've got a full plate and you sense that God might have more for you, but you aren't sure how to squeeze it in, instead of using the plate theory, think of yourself more like a tiered cake stand. You've got a big plate at the bottom. And when a new opportunity comes, you don't shove it on, you move up a level. You're still overseeing, you still care, you might even still have responsibility for things on the lower plate, but you move up in leadership. So you might outsource some things at home. Maybe if you have an opportunity to get a job or get a promotion and you have a little bit more money or you negotiate a little bit more money, you actually use that to buy a housekeeper or maybe you do aftercare for your kids or you hire a tutor so that it's not so demanding on you. Whatever those things are, maybe you, I like to outsource cooking personally. I would much prefer to eat out than to cook at home. That's one of the first things to get outsourced for me. And then you keep moving up, keep moving up. Instead of getting rid of things or getting rid of people, maybe those friendships, you put them all together and you have a dinner every other month rather than individual coffees every other week. You just divide and conquer your time differently, move up in leadership so you are still got your touch, but you're living at a higher level. I love that. And I love that what you mentioned because there are things, as we know, in our life we can outsource and things we can't outsource. And there's so many things we can. You can outsource laundry. You can outsource cleaning. You can outsource food. And there's things we can't, like you talked about, like relationships and our children and our, you know, or our spouse. And so I love just thinking about what can I outsource? And it's funny. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and we were talking about um, how how much work has just changed over the years. And We were talking about, you know, just how older men still have women at home packing their lunch every day, right? Because that's just the model that was back then. I would love to have a housewife. I think I would thrive with that. (laughs) So that's the the thing. We were like, we need a housewife, you know? Like, yeah. And so you do, you can outsource those things. You can outsource the things that that aren't, you know, they're not going to make or break you being a part of them. You can, they can literally get done without you being there. And I think that's, as you move up in leadership, you have to think that way. It's it's not even a, a maybe you should. It's like you you kind of have to because you, as your capacity expands, things the, that corn or whatever right it has to flow off the plate, and someone That's else right. has to to hold that for you. I always get great inspiration from Proverbs thirty one. I know a lot of women look at that woman and feel like it's a homemaker person, or they get intimidated by her. I'm like. This girl has like a business. She's got servant girls. She's got people doing laundry. She's outsourced that she's got time to go and like find the finest linen for her business. 
this is the person I want to be and am striving to be. So I think it's a biblical principle to outsource as much as you possibly can. Yeah, no, I I do not see her as a homemaker either. I think she is is running a business, and I think she's such a great model for all of us. Boss woman, yeah. yes, yes, it's, it's cool, and I and I love that. I love looking at Deborah and how she was a judge. I mean, I think there are just just really cool examples of women in the Bible who who led, and I think that a lot of times when you know, in the, if you've grown up in the corporate world, like you lead. If you grow up in the church world, sometimes you can feel like there's a lid on leading. And so I just love that. It's like no matter where you are, lead in the way God's called you to lead. Like, don't that's right. Don't put a lid. God's on. not your God's will for your life cannot be thwarted by any system, by any leader, by any policy, by any theology. He's going to use you the way he wants to use you. You can trust him to do that if you stay close and if you follow him and if you be bold when he says to do something you go for it. I love that. I want to hear a little bit about this book before we before we head out today. Just give us a little bit of an idea when you wrote this book, Finding Your Leadership Voice in 90 Days. Who are you writing this for? And what are some of the nuggets that ladies are going to glean out of this book? Sure. Well, this book was really an overflow of the work that I do with uh, male leaders, uh, particularly around this topic of female leadership, because um, most of the people I work with are male leaders, leading organizations, running churches, owning businesses who have female leaders who have a lot of capacity, but they're getting stuck in their leadership pipelines or they're just not being promoted and they've got cultural issues. They've got personal leadership practices. They want to shift their mindset. And so that's really been the doors God has opened for me. But as I was doing that, I wrote a book called Developing Female Leaders that Uh, did really well. And a lot of people are using that. I consult with a lot of organizations and businesses around that. And every time I would go, I would work with the men and we talk about these biases and things. But then I would also meet with the women who were getting great doors of opportunity open. They were getting raises. They were getting promotions. But most of them, to be really honest, Natalie, were miserable. They were not having that much fun. And uh, they were sometimes the first woman on the team or the only woman on the team or they were, there were several women getting promoted and it just was the jobs were overwhelming and they're like looking at their family and they're like, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I doing this to you? And it's just stressful. There's like resistance and bias and, you know, what's them? What's me? Do I use my voice? Do I not use my voice? Especially when you come from a faith background or working in a faith setting that has some opinions about what women can and cannot do or what their place is or their biases around gender roles are pretty strong. It's, it is a big energetic dance for women to know when can I speak up? When do I not speak up? Am I overstepping my line? Am I holding back? And then we've sort of got a cultural mandate for women to like, use your voice. Don't ever be silenced. And as a Christian, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, Jesus was silent a lot, you know? <laughs> so like, how do I do that? And so that dance, I, I understand that dance. I felt that I've lived it. I still live it. And so I really wanted to kind of take women on a 90 day journey. It takes 21 days to make a new habit, but it takes 90 days to change a mindset. And so I wrote it very purposefully because I am a trainer at heart. Um, I wrote it very purposefully to take women on a journey of how do I start unwrapping that sticky floor mindset or those concepts in my mind that are limiting my own belief in myself. And then how do I know from scripture, when do I speak up and when do I stay silent? When is it right for me to advocate for myself or someone else? And when am I overstepping my lane and putting my nose in business that's not mine? Those are all really real questions and it's hard to dissect that. And so I walk women through a whole bunch of different categories of how to really sort of understand your actual calling in work or in church or even at home or with your family. What authority has God given me? What are the gifts and callings he's placed on me? When are the times when he's opening the door? What do I do when I'm supposed to stay silent? How do I use my voice to help other people? And how do I use my voice to advocate for myself? And when is that appropriate? And when is that being selfish? Mm -hmm. And so um, in that journey, that's really the process that we do. And we've gotten a ton of really positive feedback on it. It's little baby bites every day. Um, I wouldn't say it's a super spiritual book that you can like use it as your devotional, (laughs) but I do recommend, you know, starting the day. uh, We've got like some free coaching emails. If you want more stuff that kind of go along with it, there's a video curriculum you can take friends through where I bring sort of my best leadership lessons on how to, if you find yourself in an organization for the first time, you're trying to navigate your own journey of being wounded or the thing that boss said to you four years ago that's still ringing loud. 
Yeah. So it's really an equipping series to try to help women fast forward to the place where they're more productive, more fruitful, and have more joy and confidence in our work. Leadership is yeah. hard. If it's not fun, man, I don't blame you for wanting to quit, but please don't quit. Please <laughs> stay in the game and use resources like Find Your Leadership Voice in 90 Days to help keep you moving forward into all that God has called you to be and to do. I love this. And what I love about it too is, is like, as I'm thinking about all the different um, scenarios you mentioned, I'm thinking, ladies, do this in a group with other women. I'm thinking, um, lead a group and take them through this. I'm thinking, you know, find a friend at least so that you have someone to bounce those ideas off and the, the knowledge that you're gaining, the wisdom that you're learning. Like, don't just gain it alone, right? So often I think women, it's feel lonely in leadership because they don't take anybody with them. And we've got to at least take one person with us as we grow and as, as we learn. So, well, yeah. let's, let's yeah. be honest. Finding fellow female leaders is not easy, it's not easy. right? There's yeah. a lot of women who don't have gifts of leadership or should not be leading. Just like there's a whole bunch of men out there who should not be leading either. Right. And so just as a little shout out, please don't do this alone, but find someone you want to spend time with. That's you right. might have to look outside your circle you might have to look outside your organization. You might have to look outside your church. But there are women who are doing great things, who love God and who want to grow. And the, the challenge is um, when we get through this kind of content and when we're doing it, we forget, right? Those mm -hmm. those sticky floor comments, those lies we believe, those yeah. things that were said to us, they're so loud. And we need each other to remind ourselves of the things we've already learned, right? Very few people give me a whole new nugget about myself that I've never thought of. It's more like, <laughs> oh my gosh, you're right. I am totally like that. And I've known that for 20 years, but this week I forgot, right? <laughs> we need people to remind us of what we already know because it keeps us on track. It keeps us encouraged. Mm -hmm. It's those Barnabases, you know, in the trenches with us. And so, yeah, this is a great opportunity, not only to do that, but to forge those friendships. This is a great rally point to connect with someone you only have to stick with her for a few weeks. And if it doesn't work out, you can break up at the end of the book. But at least you can give it a try and see if you can start building that support network of women who get you and who you want to spend time with. I love that. Where can people find you? Where can they follow you? Sure. The best place is on my website, uh, Katie Cole. That's spelled K-A-D-I-C-O-L-E.com. And I'm also at Katie Cole on all of the socials. We do have a lot of free resources, other books, video things. So um, please check it out if you're interested. I have a monthly newsletter that specifically talks about research around women and leadership. So if this conversation is interesting to you, you'd probably enjoy that as well. Love this. And I feel like I could talk to you for two more hours because this <laughs> is just chucked full with, with such goodness and such wisdom for women. And I just, I love that it flows out of you. So it's, it's deep in there. So ladies, Get this, get these resources and start to get around people that have gone before you and are ahead of you in life that can, can pour into you in a way. And, and just what's in here is going to be so good for you. So thank you, Katie, for your time. This has been so awesome. I hope the ladies will, will connect with you and just glean more. Awesome. Thank you, Natalie, so much. And I really appreciate you and your leadership as well. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, if you haven't stepped into community, ladies, I want to know, what are you waiting for? Head over to Thrive today.com to learn more about what we are doing as part of this community. And as you lead your life, we want you to do it with leadership, community, and strength. Don't forget to thrive, and we'll see you next time.